everyone, I'm Mara. Um, I'm a master's student here, but the work I'm going to tell you about happened before I was a master's student here and is concurrent now. But I'm just saying it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a student here. So um, I'm going to be talking about measuring things in community gardens. At first, this is going to sound like the case for quantitative methods. Um, it's not. It's going to be a mixed methods talk, but I just want to put that out there first. Um, so some context about community gardens in New York City. New York City has a specific history of community gardens that it shares with Philly and Boston and a couple other cities in this region. The story of community gardens is very different elsewhere in the country and also in the world. Um, but in New York City, it's a function of urban disinvestment and decline in the 70s and 80s and probably also 60s where specific neighborhoods were literally burnt down because their fire departments were closed. Um, and those neighborhoods were, for the, for the most part, poor neighborhoods of color. And so the result of that, you know, that, that picture at the, at the bottom is kind of the famous, the Bronx is burning story, right? So landlords with white flight and resources leaving New York City, landlords just burnt their buildings down to collect the insurance even if people were still living there. So now our city has a lot of vacant lots. Uh, they look like this, you've probably seen them. And when landlords abandoned their buildings, the city ended up owning them. So the city owns a lot of vacant land in New York City. It's mostly owned by HPD, Housing Preservation and Development. Um, but there are other agencies who own land and they don't even know it. Um, so people started to take over these vacant lots because they were ugly, right? They're pretty ugly, they're fenced off. A lot of them have barbed wire, um, and they became sites for um, dumping and drugs and other things that people didn't want on their blocks. So people started to do something with them. Um, the community gardens in New York City, a lot of them started as beautification projects and just neighbors kind of cleaning up the neighborhood. Uh, building raised beds because the soil is toxic, which is a function, which is part of the legacy of dumping. Um, there's lots of heavy metals in our soil. And growing things, flowers, food, native plants, every single garden is different. Every single garden has a different story in New York City. And for the most part, they are all started by people who live on the block or nearby. Um, the map, so the map of community gardens is almost the same map as vacant lots in New York City. It's really close. Um, so you can see how community gardens come out of this density of vacant lots. So people ask me like why there aren't community gardens in their neighborhoods if they live in the south half, south half of Brooklyn or wherever else, and it's because they didn't have the same those neighborhoods didn't have the same history of being burnt down and gutted. Um, as these other neighborhoods, and that's where community gardens still are today. This is all up-to-date maps, <laughs> all today. Um, and they're awesome. They're great places where people come together. Now we're starting to see more of the story that other cities see, like San Francisco and Atlanta. Community gardens are started mostly by nonprofits on behalf of another population, like for refugees or for something like that. Um, we're starting to see more of that here, where nonprofits are getting involved, but for the most part, it's still people just doing things for themselves. Um, and so they really peaked in number in the 90s. And then after that, Giuliani decided that all the gardeners were communists and tried to sell them all to developers. Um, he was getting, trying to get rid of as many vacant lots as he could uh, and focused on, on the community gardens specifically because they were these sites where people were doing things for themselves. Um, there are some amazing quotes from that era from Giuliani calling gardeners the enemy, and all these fun things. Um, which is sad, because we know, you know, in this room, that gardens are great things. They provide lots of environmental benefits. They provide lots of social benefits that have been pretty well documented. Um, and so he tried to put them all up for auction, and people started to fight back, um, protecting these spaces in their neighborhood because they were valuable on all these fronts. So gardeners began to mobilize. The New York City Community Garden Coalition formed um, in the late 90s. I'm on the board of it currently. I've been working with them since 2009. More gardens, Time's Up, like a bunch of other organizations really rallied behind the gardens and fought to protect them. The coalition still meets monthly to protect the gardens because still to this day, there's no law preserving community gardens. Um, but 
Elliot Spitzer sued. He was the attorney general at the time for the state. He sued the city on behalf of the gardens. Um, and he won for the most part. Actually, yeah, but a step back. This was the first map that was made of community gardens was in that moment of crisis. So the city actually has part of the parks department is called Green Thumb and they work with community gardens and they register community gardens but they never had a map before this crisis where Grow NYC, which used to be the Council on the Environment of New York City, began mapping the gardens in the year 2000 and put it up on Oasis, which those of you in New York City probably are familiar with this. And that map is still there and it's still updated every few years and actually I, I was one of those few years. I updated it in 2009 um, and that's that was my first involvement with community gardens in New York City after I came from Boston. So the <coughs> agreement, oh, that wasn't, came from another slide, <coughs> another presentation. The agreement preserved some community gardens and it slated others as subject to development. Anyway, those that were slated for preservation actually still don't have any protections. Um, and so in, 2009, in 2010, this set of rules around the gardens were slated to expire, and so the gardeners were worried. They were like, okay, we've been protected for 10 years, um, from actually a little less than 10 years, but 2002 to 2010, there are these rules that said, hey, Giuliani can't do anything with these. Um, and then they expired, and the gardeners were a little freaked out. And <coughs> so while I was mapping, I also did a nine-page survey with all the community gardens, just trying to document what they were doing. And it was a long survey, but it was lacking in a lot of things. So after spending a full year walking around, talking to community gardeners and doing this survey, I realized that there was a lot more we could be documenting. And so if we were going to make the case for community gardens to New York City, stories would only do so much, protests and rallies would only do so much, and community organizing would only do so much. We also needed to speak the city's language, which is data. And so I started a project called Farming Concrete, which was working with community gardeners to collect their own data to be able to share their value with the city um, in a different way than they were before. So Farming Concrete first started um, with the low-hanging fruit of measuring food production, which is easy, and a lot of gardeners were already doing it. And so with 1500 bucks from Green Thumb, we bought a bunch of scales and we went out to community gardens by, you know, by hand. A lot of community gardens, again, because they're you know, in neighborhoods that lack a lot of resources and a lot of these gardeners are aging. A lot of community gardens in New York City are not on the internet and they barely even have working phones. They're very hard to reach. So if I was going to reach everyone, we, went, we had to go out on foot and find them in the garden. Uh, and we did. So this is an example of us just like stopping by a garden and dropping off materials. We left notes on the locked gates. That actually worked. Um, I didn't think it would. It totally worked. We got some gardeners who found our notes and ended up being part of the project for over three years. Um, it started in the first, 2010 was our first season. Um, and it was originally going to be a three year project because it was no one's day job. Uh, that's Tom Angadi. I don't know if you guys know him. He's an awesome professor. He is also a gardener, and I got to meet him and deliver him a scale, and <laughs> that's his wife. <coughs> so, um, so the original method was just these scales and these harvest logs, um, and the first year we used SurveyMonkey to collect the data most people, again, not have, they don't have computers, they were not on the internet, so they mailed us their, um, their harvest logs, and I typed them in. And it was fun, because I got to see what everyone was doing around the city. Like, wow, that person harvested 16 pounds of garlic in one day. What are they going to do with that? <laughs> um, it was really fun. The second year, we wrote Barn, which is our online database, um, which gardeners could enter in the data, see themselves on a map, they could get the raw data back, and they could also click a button that would generate a PDF report with charts and graphs already laid out. Um, and so we did this for three years, and we talked to the gardeners who were participating about why they were uh, you know, getting involved. The first year, <coughs> we were recruiting gardeners specifically because the rules were expiring. So we had something 
that would require citywide data, right? So this data doesn't exist. That's kind of why we're doing it. And the gardeners could really benefit from it. And I was a community gardener and a community garden activist, and I was like, we need more to be able to make the case to the city. After 2010, after the rules were expired, and they you know, made some new ones, we didn't have that same crisis. Although community gardens still, again, don't have this legal protection in New York City, it's qua the agreement is qua quasi-legal. Any mayor can just scrap it. Um, and it's hardly followed. Gardens still get destroyed in the middle of the night without any notice. Um, so just to give some context, a lot of gardens now are expanding in their programming, while before it used to be a lot of just gardeners growing food for themselves or making a community park or a shared backyard space or a back barbecue space or even a do place for dogs or place for kids. Um, now a lot of them are increasing their programming, they're partnering with schools, they're doing things to embed themselves in the neighborhoods so that they can't get be getting rid of as easily. Um, and so they're writing grants. With grants you need information. So we got a lot of folks who are doing this because they are writing grants and the funders are asking them for this kind of information. But also, the more we talked to folks, the more they were like, you know, we don't really don't identify with our food production being our one major thing that we should be measuring here. We're doing so much more than that. So what can we do? Um, and so, oh, and this is the, <coughs> <coughs> the software that we wrote also tallies everything up so we can see it, which is nice. We can count as we go. Um, we published about our methods, which I'm just noting here because I hadn't even started a master's degree. And it's the you can still publish. I'm just saying that. You can still publish. Oh. Huh. This kind of got funky. So... <coughs> So there's definitely a desire in community gardens, in, amongst community gardeners, to start to really measure the impact that we're having on the city. And so we decided to measure everything. So <clears throat> at the same time, or a little bit after Farming Concrete started, Design Trust for Public Space also got really interested in urban agriculture and tried to do a similar project. Um, and so we partnered because we already had the tech infrastructure for data collection, and we also had a network of community gardeners already on board for collecting data. Um, and so, and we also had kind of a politics that they didn't necessarily have. After our first year, I was able to get a grant, like a pretty big grant for the project, and I used all of it to pay the gardeners who had done it in the first year to go out and find new gardeners. I also bought some scales, because we always have to buy new scales. But, so we had this, like, this method or this strategy of gardeners teaching gardeners so that when farming concrete itself wasn't it, you know, actively doing anything, that knowledge was still out there and that training it was still out there and people could just teach each other. And that's how a lot of things happen in community gardens anyway. So we partnered with Design Trust for Public Space who comes with lots of resources and fancy design people. Um, and so they were able to hire a bunch of gardeners and farmers to come sit in a room and discuss what it is they wanted to measure and then come up with how we were going to measure it. So we did that in one day. It was awesome. And we came up with this, which is a whole list of things to measure. And I have it all in the binder here. Um, so from that workshop of figuring out what to measure and how to measure it, we turned it all into like these lovely <coughs> protocols, cutouts, things you can post on the garden, uh, billboard in the front of the garden. It's all analog, it's all things that can be done on paper. Um, so they're a way to kind of quantify, you guys can look at that and pass it around. They're a way to document things like moods changed in the garden and skills shared in the garden and kind of these deeper, more qualitative ideas, but that we could still come up with a common method so we could aggregate it across the city. So it was a way for us to kind of translate a little bit all of these other things that we wanted to be able to measure in our gardens, which was like wellness, um, changes in attitude amongst kids, right? So we have a little game called Yum and Yuck, where we can work with kids, because a lot of them you know, might not eat a raw green bean. They've never had a raw green bean, or it's a vegetable, so they automatically say, gross, I don't like it. They try it, and then they vote again. <coughs> So there are all these things you can do in the garden. 
to start to quantify those things. Um, so that was cool. Um, there's different ways to do everything. So there's four different ways to measure compost because everyone's doing compost differently. This is the other thing um, that we felt really strongly about and that farming concrete was built on is that all gardeners are different. They're all doing things differently and our methods have to be flexible. So if we want to be able to share methods with gardeners that can then result in data that can be aggregated across the city, it has to be, like that's a great honorable goal, but it has to work for everyone in order to work. Um, so with those harvest logs, some gardeners, <coughs> this is like a really big part of it, um, not every gardener in a garden is gonna measure what they grow. If a garden has 100 members growing food, maybe two of them, realistically, are gonna write down what they grow. So what do you do? Um, so we came up with this other thing called crop count, where when we brought the scale to the garden, we worked with the garden coordinator, whoever was there, to literally count every single edible crop <laughs> in the garden so that we had those two gardeners who were measure, who were weighing their stuff in this garden, the two gardeners over there, the five over there, the one guy over there, and we had them measure pounds per plant so that we could average out across the city on average for like 2011, how many pounds per plant gardeners were growing, which takes into account things like people disappear in August and gardeners are all different levels, skill levels, and not sometimes visitors come through the garden and steal your tomatoes. So it's kind of an average of what you can expect in a community garden in New York City. Um, and then we extrapolated that out to the crop count to estimate for a garden how much they grew that year. So now gardeners could get an estimate for how much they grew that year without actually having to write everything down. So there was that kind of flexibility that we built into all of these other tools. Some gardeners are gonna wanna measure their compost by the food scraps coming in. Some are going to want to measure the finished product. It's all up there. <coughs> and it doesn't require anything besides like a bucket and some tape and some markers. All of them are like that. None of them require any infrastructure. This is Beauty of the Garden, meant to... It's used in a lot of different ways. Um, it was meant to start to answer the question, are we... Are we um, how are we impacting the people in the neighborhood who walk by? Is this making their day better? How can we know? Um, the people who are not part of this garden, the people who are part of this garden, the people who cross the gate, the people who do not cross the gate. Like, is it making them happier? <laughs> this was like a big question. How do we start to measure that? So there was this uh, beauty in the garden idea that came out where we put priceless tags on the thing that strikes you the most. So an example of how this was used is my friend run, runs a farm on Randall's Island. He gets a lot of kids coming through on school tours. That's like all he does all day is school tours. The kids come once, they never come again. And so he did this with them and had them put tags on things they thought were pretty or interesting. <coughs> and he found out that they thought that tax soy was really like super interesting and beautiful. And he never even brought them over there because they're kids and kids don't necessarily like leafy greens. He never showed it to them before. Like they also put a bunch of tags on the chicken coop and that he knew. But this one he didn't, so he changed his whole tour based on that. Um, and other gardeners did it too. Sitting out like in front of the garden at a table and just asking passersby to go in and label something pretty that they thought was pretty to see how they were impacting those who walked by. This is what barn looks like now, now that we've had fancy designers look at it. <laughs> it's a lot nicer. Um, and we've opened it up to gardens outside of New York City. So now there are gardeners in Philly and in Buffalo, New York, and Austin, Texas, and Manchester, and all these other places who are starting to enter their data as well. This is what Beauty of the Garden looks like on the internet. So we found ways to really, yeah, to kind of answer these deeper questions about community gardens and still start to collect data in a way that we can now share a story with the city if we wanted to. What else did I want to say? Um, it's a dynamic project, it's always growing and changing. Some gardeners want to, um, you know, be able to write down. We can, that's the other thing about this is because we're, like I use it on my site, my day job is I co-run the urban farm at Kingsborough Community College. So that was the other reason why I wanted all these things is because I needed it for my job too. Um, I needed to be able to measure, <coughs> excuse me, all the things we were doing outside of just food production. And so one of the other gardeners wanted to, you know, 
share different varieties, right? So like these green beans are rattlesnake green beans. There are lots of varieties of everything. Which ones work best for you? Which ones suck? Which ones like really don't grow well in New York City? Um, some way to be able to share that kind of information. And so now we're starting to build that kind of functionality in where gardens can share that information, how it went. Um, we're gonna be, at the end of this year, we'll have a public facing page for barn that'll be called the mill. So the barn is where we store the data, the mill, I guess, from people who are not collecting data is gonna be where you can find the data. So funders and gardeners who wanna see who, what everyone else is doing will be able to access this public facing page with all the raw data. And gardeners will be able to opt out of having their garden name and address listed, but at the very least it will have zip code. And all the raw data, like every single harvest logged is gonna be in there. Um, so we haven't, we're in the process of building that now. Um, and ways of refining and tweaking. So the Community Garden Coalition, I can just give an example of how this data has been used. Um, a couple years ago, Green Thumb, again, the part of the Parks Department that, was, that works with community gardens, the city actually doesn't pay any money for. It's all funded by federal community development block grants. And so with the economic downturn, those, that funding was threatened. So therefore, Green Thumb was threatened, and so the New York City Community Garden Coalition, being the activist organization, stepped up and said, how about the city pays for some of it? And we were able to estimate, based on farming concrete data, the amount of money that community gardens were generating in just food production. And again, that's like just a tiny part of what community gardens do. And we were able to show that just the food production was like way more than Green Thumb's entire budget. And so we can start to show you know, what community gardens do in that way. Um, so I'll take questions. What, what do you got for me? Always hard to be the first. I'm pushing the only slow event that it was, so I hope you enjoy it. But it does shock me with this last figure that, um, that the amount of food uh, that community gardens generate is uh, bigger if expressed in dollar amounts than uh, with the budget, right? Mm -hmm. So how did you guys uh, estimate that? Um, so part of, yeah, so like I mentioned, we have the, the crop count, which is an inventory of edible crops. Mm -hmm. And in the crop count, we also write down the dimensions of the raised beds. So we know how many plants there are per square feet, and then we know the estimated yield of the plants. And then, so we can also, if we just like lump all the data together, estimate yield per square foot, which is not a great measure, mm -hmm. but we can do it. And then Green Thumb, as part of their annual site business that they do for all the community gardens, keeps track of raised beds. <laughs> oh. So we went through and we found all the gardens with raised beds and we, and we just extrapolated out. So I'll ask a question. I think a lot of geographers, people who decided to major in geography or decided to do something with geography did it because they liked the idea of getting into geography themselves with their bodies, like moving and getting around, getting outside, and I think very few of us actually get outside. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of us would like to do something like you're doing. Um, a lot of getting outside may, may involve interacting with the community, um, but that's kind of scary for an introvert. Like, how did you, did you throw yourself onto somebody, or how did you, like, <laughs> how did you do it at the very beginning? Like, how did you get into it? Yeah. Did you meet somebody that pulled you in, or were you, like, going at it, or, you know? Yeah, um, it was definitely hard at first, because community gardens are overstudied. They're sick and tired of being the subject of studies. So there was a lot of skepticism coming at this, but I think the fact that, you know, I wasn't a grad student, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't in that position. I wasn't doing research for my own benefit. I was part of a larger group who recognized the need for more information about the work we were doing. Um, so I think that was part of it, which doesn't help at all. But I think, I mean, and this is like one of the critiques I have about academia in general, is that a lot goes into producing data, 
and for, into producing research, and often it ends up in an academic journal and it doesn't end up anywhere else. And so communities that are studied don't really get to see what happens after that. They don't get to see the results, they don't hear about it, for the most part. And so I think once folks realized that this was not that story, that this was a different story, um, that they were totally on board. The only folks who, after hearing more about the context of the project, didn't, still were not that excited about writing things down, were folks who thought that if the city actually knew how much food they were growing, they would try to tax them or yeah. tell them to grow more. Right. Um, and they didn't want that to happen. And I was like, dude, the city like is not gonna look at this debt. <laughs> I don't know. They're not gonna be pay attention, and they, you know, they all agreed. But yeah. Um, so where where are y'all in terms of securing like a concrete law that you can't just go lose a garden in the middle of the night? Where, where, is there like a bill in city council? Is there mm -hmm. any, is no. There a bill maybe going to be written that's going to be on city council? <laughs> um, so this is the board. thing is that because a lot of the gardens are on HPD land, <clears throat> HPD has no money right now. Now is actually a great time to start a community garden, but they make you sign this thing that says that you know that you're temporary. But they didn't make other gardens sign that. Mm -hmm. So what happens is HPD decides to build something and now the garden has to get out. Um, although that's not always the story. The garden that I mentioned that was just bulldozed in the middle of the night is clearing the way for a new amphitheater in Coney Island, which is, it's, we actually sued the city on behalf of the gardeners oh, because it was totally wrong. Went. It's still in progress. They haven't started building because of the suit, which is actually nice of them because they totally could start building. Um, but they haven't, which is great. Um, so how close are we to a law? Not are close. They, is, that, is that still a goal? It's still a goal. It's still a goal. It's still a goal, or at least some zoning category, because in the city, in Pluto right now, community gardens are all labeled as vacant lots. They're invisible. They're completely right. invisible to the city. Um, and so something that would make them visible would be great, at the very least, because the city still has to have the option. Like, technically speaking, even Central Park is not permanent. They are scared of the word permanent. Right. And for community gardens, and this is, happens a lot, is like. Over 30 years, the gardeners are reduced down to one or two older people, and then what happens if they can't anymore? And at that point, usually they're like, this is my backyard, you can't come in here. Totally understandable, but also, if it's not actually community-based, the city has almost every right to go in and take it away. Which, so now a lot, so a lot of like the preservation work, some of it is legislative, and we're trying to make the case in court, in these court cases, we're trying to set the precedent in these court cases. There are a few court cases, if you're interested in, that are ongoing right now. One is the NYU expansion is trying to take over a community garden. And that is a different case. And it's great. And it's like happening now. Um, so I can talk about that. But I think you have a question, too. I did have a question. I mean, something you mentioned early on, something that I work on and a lot of people doing policy work are interested in, is the, the sometimes dual and sometimes trilingual you have to become. like. You have to become, you have to speak the language of policy mm -hmm. and the language of maybe your gardener and maybe multi, your multiple gardeners all speak different languages. And I don't just mean like they speak Italian or Spanish, they, they speak uh, the language of the soil, you know, yeah. or whatever. Um, and uh, I just I wonder if you could like speak a little bit more about like kind of trying to talk to, you know, to policymakers um, versus, you know, other audiences. Yeah. Um, policymakers tend to just roll their eyes when we mention community gardens because it's been this long contentious issue all the time. Mm -hmm. And in theory, they all stand behind it. They're like, yeah, community gardens are awesome. They're great. They're these green spaces. They're, especially now with the interest in urban agriculture, now they're focusing all on that and they think it's really interesting and exciting and they think that's all community gardens are for. And so then there's this like eclipsing of the conversation that happens. That's the conversation that happens on the policy level. Um, with gardeners, it's a lot of different things. I mean, a lot of gardeners are recognizing that they need to be like more visible and more active. And so actually, some of these data collection tools help them set goals and see if they're achieving them, right? Like, if our goal is to give kids these experiences in gardens, are we actually doing that? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think just like presenting this idea of measuring things as something that 
has a lot of different good reasons for you know anyone wanting to do it. And also presenting it as just record keeping, which a lot of gardeners were already doing already, helps. Um, so it depended on like what the gardener's personal interest was. A lot of gardeners are not gardening for political reasons. Most of them are not gardening for political reasons. Like that's they're gardening because they want to put stuff in the ground, and that's awesome. Um, and so I think it, you know, when talking about this project, it just there was like a, also obviously an aspect of listening that happened to figure out where the gardeners were at and if it's built so that not everyone has to participate and we can still get a robust data set. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, <coughs> we are no longer, I mean, it was only that first year that we were really like, a citywide data set would be awesome. Right now, we're focused mostly on helping individual, like the gardeners measure the things that they would find helpful for their own work. Um, so it's mostly about that. If there is a garden that isn't fully protected, that's not on a land trust, maybe they want to start keeping these records so that if the city comes along, um, or developers come along, they have these records that they can show. Other gardeners are asking for funding. They also need that. Like, there's so many different angles for it. Um, and as like a bonus, there's going to be the citywide database. Yeah. Um, uh, two questions. First, I, I missed what exactly the agreement was between Spitzer and Bloomberg in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, and then related to that, um, has there been, on the political side, uh, you know, as, as far as, as the story is, Giuliani was hostile and then things got a little bit better under Bloomberg. I mean, what's the, what's the political development there uh, up to the present day? Um, the agreement was that um, the gardens that were going to be allowed to stay, there were, the agreement just outlines a list of things, a list of methods for the city to be able to take that garden away. It's like if they break the law in the garden, if they're doing drugs in the garden, if they're drinking in the garden, if uh, you know if the sidewalk isn't maintained. Basically, if they get a certain number of violations, the garden can be shut down. Um, that's essentially what the agreement says. It says that you actually have, there has to be something that was done wrong for a garden to be shut down. Which is not unlike a commercial space. Right. It's like almost any space. So that was all documented and written down. There are rules, there are things you have to follow. Like you can't break the law in the garden because it's city property. Um, and then it was like if this, if the city's going to sell the land to a private developer, it has to go through this whole ULURP process which means that the city council has to vote to send the issue to the state, which... The no, it's, it's the community garden. I mean, sorry, it's community boards. It's, it's, community city, boards. Plan, it's city planning commission, and then community board decide, which it's actually non binding If they decide, even they say no, yeah. and then it goes to city council, and then they vote, and then it goes to the mayor. And the, if the mayor, they, the city council could override a vote of mayor's veto if they wanted to. Is that... For every individual plot of land, I don't. I mean, that's how the ULA process works. Okay. That's for rezoning something. It's not the state is not involved with it. It's the city. In fact, there's not a way. There's not like an like the Atlantic Yards controversy. That was state-owned land because it was MTA, which is state, and there wasn't a ULA process, and that was part of the problem. There was no like way of having a public discussion. But like with ULA, it's supposed to be the um, community board mm -hmm. is like the first. I think it might be slightly right. different with green space because yeah. this has to be alienated. Right. Um, so that's the other great thing that was documented is that the community garden land actually has to be alienated by the state. That's not true either. If it's city We're land, making the case. We're making the case okay. for public trust doctrine that community gardens should be deal dealt with as parks. And if that's the case, then the city has to vote to get rid of it. Okay. That's the case that that so it's different and than Euler, the, but it's, a, it's different than Euler, but, but it's, it still is a process. It's a barrier. Yeah. It's not always followed. So with the with the Coney Island case, the city is technically doing a public private partnership with this private developer that's gonna build the amphitheater. And so they're taking away an acre and a half community garden, or they already bulldozed it and putting down an amphitheater, which is not green space, but they can argue that it's still a park kind of like how the Banshell and Prospect Park is part of a park. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't argue that they didn't follow like the proper procedures with that garden 
because they were like, but it's still a park. That's really funny. I mean, there's something. It's not similar. <coughs> kind of similar in uh, Queens. There's like this, they're trying to build a new mall mm -hmm. right by uh, Flushing Meadows Park, and there's this parking lot that was that was parkland that was then alienated by Robert Moses specifically just for Shea Stadium, and now they want to turn this. A lot of people want to turn it back into a park, but there's like this whole thing about turning into a mall, mm -hmm. and there was a court case uh, just on the city level, and the judge just decided like. Oh, actually, it's still falling under Parkland because malls are like forms of uh, entertainment. Recreation. Recreation. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, like it's amazing. Really, it's really amazing. That's really amazing. Yeah. And actually, that ties a little bit. This, this conversation ties back into Marissa's question about these different languages. The New York City Community Garden Coalition has a legislative committee. Nobody's a lawyer in that room. Like, nobody speaks that language. We're making stuff up. Like, we don't know. It'd be really helpful to find people who, like, know what they're doing to sit in that room. Um, and sometimes it works. I mean, we have a long relationship at this point with members of city council, and we can request meetings and sit in our room and be like, is this, are we on point? Is this totally whack? Like, should we throw this out a window? Um, like, is this something that can happen? So at some point, we started going down the path of changing the city's charter. And after several conversations with, like, city council members, they were like, that's not the best idea because any mayor can just come through and change it again. Right. Um, so we have those conversations where we check in with politicians and see if this is something that's viable. Our next, I think the next move that we're going to make is to talk to super local politicians about their own districts, about what work in their own district, and not try to do a citywide thing. I think that um, could work. I mean, that's kind of how participatory budgeting is just four districts, yeah. now it's 22. Um, you know, things can grow in that way, too. And so if something works, like, within a district by district level. So, 